Okay, so welcome to the eighth installment of the PASS Facebook Live pop-up expert series. In the session, you have the opportunity to ask me any of your DAX and data modeling for Power BI and analysis services related questions uh, in real time, uh, live Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, please type it into the comment section below now and they'll appear on screen as I answer them. Okay, let's go ahead. So uh, before starting, of course, uh, some more about myself. I've been uh, working with uh, uh, DAX uh, since 2010 uh, and before that uh, with Analysis Services, uh, which is the engine that runs uh, uh, also the DAX language now. So I was a former uh, expert also in MDX. I worked in business intelligence for too many years now. And uh, before that, I was also a developer. So for this reason, I still contributed to some open source tool like DAX Studio today, even though DAX Studio is a project uh, mainly driven by Darren Gosper, who lives in uh, Melbourne, Australia. So let's see if uh, there is some uh, question to start. Uh, let me see, because I don't see the questions uh, coming. Uh, oh, OK. Which new DAX features are you excited about? So this is the first question to ask. Uh, well, today I have to be honest, I'm excited about uh, the uh, calculation groups uh, feature, which is a new feature that has been announced the last week, uh, but actually I, I knew about this feature for at least one year, but I wasn't able to disclose anything about this. And this feature is uh, basically uh, important in DAX, uh, even though many people probably only see the, the surface of uh, this feature that allows to uh, apply a transformation to existing measures. So, so you can uh, apply the year to date to all the existing measures without having uh, to create uh, new measures for each transformation. This could be very, very useful. And uh, the thing is that uh, this uh, feature is uh, more important than you can imagine, probably, because there are a number of uh, scenarios that are open by the ability to inject uh, filters into the, uh, the DAX expression. Uh, the idea is that uh, we have a part of the features that were available in MDX through the MDX scope. Not everything, but uh, a good part. So actually, today, this is the feature I'm more excited, even though you have to wait uh, maybe until the end of the year before going in production with this feature and maybe more before being able to create models in Power BI using this feature because the feature will be available only in analysis services and uh, Power BI Premium at the beginning. Basically because uh, you need uh, an editor that you don't have in Power BI. This is the main reason why this feature is not available immediately. Okay, so next question. Any idea when the calendar table allowing a 554-454-454-454 setup for 53 weeks years will be made available? Ah, that's an interesting question. So the problem of this is the following. Probably the, the question is related to the uh, DAX date template, which is uh, an open source project uh, that uh, today only I work as a contributor, but uh, it's open to anyone. It's a GitHub uh, repository. Uh, you can find a link on sqlbi.com. And uh, the current implementation manages uh, uh, only 52 weeks uh, and 53 weeks uh, every, I don't remember how many years, in the uh, week-based calendar. And actually, I don't remember how it is managed now. I, I think is uh, the, the the additional week is added to the last uh, quarter. And the question is about uh, adding this additional week to the first quarter, which requires a, some change in the code, uh, not trivial. So uh, currently, I'm uh, very busy in uh, finishing the, the second edition of the DAX book uh, and uh, other things. So I don't think it's something that I will, uh, uh, I will not be able to work on it very, very soon. So if anyone is a uh, you know wants to contribute and find that the additional code required, uh, just uh, push the new version of the DAX code required. I will try to merge and uh, to create a unified version. So no date now, but uh, any contribution uh, will be welcome here. Next question. Let's see. 
Let's see another question. No. So, what are the calculation groups you tweeted about last week? Uh, oh, this is exactly <laughs> related to the to the answer I, uh, to the previous question. But uh, yeah, the calculation groups uh, are a feature that uh, allow to create uh, like a new table, a new column. Uh, imagine a table that has a single column that you can use as a slicer in your report. In this uh, column, you create a number of items. Uh, these are called the calculation items, like uh, year to date, uh, uh, quarter to date, uh, year over year, uh, something like this. Then when you click on the slicer, you apply this transformation to the existing measure. So if your report has uh, three measures, sales amount, total cost and margin, the three measures gets the year to date calculation without having to edit uh, three new measures. That's the idea. In order to do that, you assign a DAX expression to each uh, calculation item. And this DAX expression is evaluated uh, instead of your measure. But within this expression, you can call the original measure, which means that basically you can alter the filter context of any measure that you have in the model through the selection of a calculation item in a calculation group. So basically, this is the feature. I suggest you to take a look at uh, my blog post uh, on Friday, if I remember. And uh, there is a blog post. If you go to sqlbi.com, you will find uh, one of the two articles in the home page. The one on the right has a description of this new feature and links to more detailed examples of the feature. So let's see the next question. So Chuck Jacobson, I believe that I've linked two tables in Power BI by person ID but the visual do not adjust when I click a bar based on a column from one of the tables. Is that normal? Uh, it depends. Uh, so let me guess. Uh, you have two tables and the two tables have a common uh, uh, column called uh, person ID. Now, if uh, one of these two tables uh, has the person ID as a unique column, so the, the classical example, you have uh, a table customers or persons in this case, customers with customer ID, and then sales that has the customer ID. The relationship you create is a one-to-many relationship that has a direction between customers and sales, which means that, that, which means that by default, if you filter any, any column in the customer table, you also filter sales, but the opposite is not true, which means that uh, if you filter for example, uh, something in the sales table, you are not filtering the customer. So depending on the, the direction of the filter, you can alter this by changing uh, the filter direction in the relationship. However, I suggest you to not enable the bidirectional filter unless you really know what you are doing, because there are a number of side effects if you enable that. I mean, if your model has only two tables, that's fine, but uh, when your model grows and you have more tables, you probably want a predictable way to, to, to propagate the filter across the tables. So probably you included the, the wrong column in the report, which means that probably you included the, the you know, person ID from the sales table instead of a customer table. Um, in order to avoid this confusion, the suggestion is when you create a relationship, the column on the many side of the relationship should be hidden. Once you hide that column, you have only one option in the visible columns, and you should pick the column from the right table. So usually this is enough to guarantee the, the, the right behavior. So Larry, uh, do you have any tips for debugging DAX expressions? Oh, yes. <laughs> the favorite tips is, uh, because we don't have a debugger, uh, we don't have a um, DAX debugger, a DAX a debugger is something that uh, probably everybody would like to see, but I don't think that we will see this uh, anytime soon, to be honest, because it's very, I mean, it's very complex. So to thinking about what is required is very complex, and probably there are many other priorities now for in terms of development. But what you can do is if you write your code using variables, and splitting the execution of the code in several steps. So you assign variable step one and you write uh, part of the uh, calculation. And then you do another part and then another part. 
what you obtain is a list of steps and the, 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 the return statement uh, basically returns the last one. However, once you did this uh, uh, definition of the DAX formula in several steps, uh, it's very easy to change the return statement, uh, returning uh, not the final step, but an intermediate step. And this way we can expect exactly what is the evaluation of the expression in the middle in your report. So if, if you replace the return statement in your measure, and you put the measure in the report, uh, when you look at the report and you uh, modify the measure, you can see the behavior of the measure in that particular filter in each cell of the report, uh, but instead of looking at the final result, which is probably wrong and you don't understand why, you can see the, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the previous steps. So you may say, oh, at this point, this number should be 50, but if it is 40, there is something wrong before this step. So you can, uh, uh, this technique can help you restricting the area of the investigation for uh, the error index that you have. So this could be the classical uh, technique. Let's see if we have another question. Jerome, when building models, uh, is it a good idea to make the keys for the relationships integers as opposed to strings for performance perspective? No, I mean, uh, the, the reality, uh, the, the answer could be complex. The, the, the short answer, it doesn't matter. The complete answer is a little bit different because uh, having a column that is a string or having a column that is an integer in the model doesn't make any difference in terms of performance at query time. No differences, period. Why? Because if you have a string, when you import the data, the data is converted internally in a compressed format where every string becomes an integer. So actually, if you replace the, the integer, sorry, if you replace the string with an integer, you're doing an operation that would be made by the engine in any case. And if you still keep the string in another column, that string will be converted into an integer too. So actually you're doing the same operation twice. However, if, we, if, if you imagine you have a model where you have two tables and a relationship, uh, two columns with a string means uh, there are two dictionaries in memory in the two tables because the two columns may not have the same content. So the dictionaries is, have to be different. If you have many unique columns, uh, sorry, many unique values in these columns, uh, the result is that you have two big dictionaries and these are expensive in memory. So having uh, two strings uh, could require an additional memory to store the two dictionaries and potentially more time to prepare the dictionary so you could slow down the processing. But this consideration is uh, good if you have a column that has a million of unique values. And at this point, you have another problem. A relationship that has a million of unique values uh, is a slow relationship, even though you use integers. So you should try to avoid these kind of relationships. So in any case, uh, um, I would the last concern I have in a tabular model is uh, do I have uh, strings or integers in the keys? My suggestion is if you have a natural key with strings, uh, use that. If your natural key is integer, use that. If you already have a data mart with surrogate keys, use them but don't spend your time, your precious time, to create an integer if you don't have an integer because the advantage you get is minimal. That's the idea. So basically use what you have because uh, internally the engine already performed the conversion to an integer by itself. Sorry. That is not expected. So David, any idea if creating a streaming data dashboard will eventually be available in Power BI report server for on-premises uh, uh, real-time string visualization? Mm, I don't have any idea. I imagine no, but I don't know. This is something that you should ask to Microsoft uh, and uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not optimistic because uh, before looking at that, you don't have the dashboard in Power BI report server. So actually there are a number of things that uh, you're missing. So 
but uh, in, a, in a report, uh, if, if the question was, uh, can we have a streaming data in a report with real time uh, uh, visuals in a report, not in a dashboard? This would be very interesting, but today we, we don't have uh, neither in uh, reporting services, uh, sorry, in uh, Power BI the service and nor Power BI report server. But actually, this is, I, I don't know. The real answer, I don't know. So, Mohamed, uh, a bit technical to prepare dashboards on financial data. Uh, any suggestions? Ah, that's a hard question because uh, what do you do? It depends on, uh, I think you should uh, clarify the question whether you, you want some tip about uh, preparing the data uh, from the point of view of uh, the data model, cleaning the data, uh, arranging the, 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 the visualizations, for example, uh, it's not clear to me what is, it's too, too, too broad as a, as a question. I, I, I don't have an answer. And by the way, I'm not an expert on particular vertical segments. So if you ask me about uh, oil and gas uh, or uh, financial or uh, healthcare, I have seen many models, but I'm not as an expert of any of these models. So I have a general knowledge about each one, and, but I'm more an expert about uh, the, the technology behind. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Eddie. So, Jerome, what is the cost in memory of the calculated table? A uh, very good question, this one, because a calculated table is like any other table. So the cost in memory after you process the table is the same of any other table. But the cost for creating a calculated table is interesting because the calculated table must be prepared in memory for all the rows of the table. They have to be uncompressed in memory. So what happens is this. When you have an expression for a calculated table, the result of the calculated uh, uh, table, the result of the expression you wrote, uh, must be materialized in memory uncompressed. And then it is compressed in memory. Which means that even though you create a, imagine you create a, um, uh, a calculated table that generates uh, 50 million rows, these 50 million rows have to be stored in memory uh, for a few seconds or minutes uh, for the time required to do the compression. Now, 50 million rows compressed could require maybe, I don't know, uh, 500 megabytes, but 50 million rows uncompressed are likely to be 25 gigabytes because uh, the, there is an overhead for each uh, row plus uh, the amount of the data for all the columns. And uh, at that point, having a column that has a string always the same in the entire column, once it is compressed, is a few bytes, but uncompressed, the same string is repeated across the entire table. When you read the same amount of data from an external data source, the maximum number of rows that are read in memory is 1 million rows for Power BI and 8 million rows for analysis services. So you never have 50 million rows uncompressed in memory. So the real issue of the calculated table, if it has many rows, it could be expensive to build, uh, to refresh the model. But once the refresh completes, then the size is the same size of a regular table, no differences. Next questions. Uh, oh, <laughs> when will the second edition of the definitive guide to DAX uh, be available? Um, I don't know, but I can give you some information, some update. Um, originally, we expected to complete the second edition of the, Defin the Definitive Guide to DAX uh, in 2018, because the calculation groups uh, that has been that is a feature that has been introduced in preview uh, a few days ago was originally planned to be in preview uh, last year. So we are almost six months late with this feature, uh, and this required us to delay. Uh, the book because we have a chapter about uh, calculation groups so that you are writing these days. Actually, we were able to prepare something, but uh, really we didn't have the code uh, until a few weeks ago. And only now that we have a CTP, we can actually play with the 
with the feature, prepare the demos and, uh, and the screenshots and everything else. And by the way, the feature is not complete yet. So actually, we have to use uh, the tabular editor to, to, to create the models, even though at the end of the year, we will have the feature in Visual Studio. But of course, the book will not cover it. The remaining part of the book is uh, ready. So actually, we should uh, complete the book this month. Uh, and then there is the time for the production, which is usually two to three months. So probably, we should have the book in June July, this is the time frame I, I expect the book to be on the shelf. So today, this is the current situation. So when do, <laughs> when do you find time to write articles and books? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. The, the, actually, this is my job uh, today because uh, we produce content for, uh, for DAX. Uh, we monetize this part of this content with uh, our uh, courses uh, and, uh, and in part for the book, but the books are not something that uh, can pay the time that you spend on it. Uh, but the writing the book is a good uh, uh, way to create material for our training, our video courses, our courses. So basically, uh, it's a mixed model. So we have some some content is for free, and part of the content is uh, is uh, is paid content. But this is basically what what we do. Uh, today for uh, for for our job so basically it's it, it, it became my job now so actually it is expected I had I have to find a time to do that so question from Chuck uh, do our visuals uh, in power bi react to the filter context uh, ah that's a good question so the 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 thing is this that an R visual, from, from the point of view of Power BI, an R visual is just like any other visual. So the R visual receives a set of data, which is the result of uh, whatever happens in the, in the report. So if, if, if the report has a slicer and you click on the slicer, this restricts the amount of data that is transferred to the visual. The visual could be Python, R, or a custom visual. And these three visuals don't have any idea about what is happening uh, around it. So they simply receive a certain amount of data. The real limitation is the ability to interact with the platform. So actually, uh, I think that there are no restrictions. You receive a filter content, but actually, you don't see the filter content. You don't see the DAX. You, you, you're not able to write the DAX code uh, in an interactive way. You just receive an amount of data and, and you can play with this data, but you don't have an, an, a way to, to, to react to this. This is something you can do with the custom visual. The custom visual has an API that allow you to push filters to other visuals, but I don't think that this is uh, allowed to, um, uh, to an R visual. I don't think that R has the ability to inject filters to other visuals, which I think is the real limitation. So you can receive a filter, even though you don't see it as a filter content. You see filter data that you receive, and you cannot push a filter to the other visuals. This, I think this is the current uh, situation for the R visuals. So the question now is, what is the most common error you see in DAX? There are two errors, actually. So probably the, the, the more common. The, the more common is not the more dangerous. The more common is when you filter a table instead of a column in Calculate. So you, you write filter, for example, filter sales, comma, sales quantity greater than zero, instead of just writing uh, Says quantity greater than zero in, in a calculate statement. This is the most common error because uh, filtering a table instead of filtering a column can generate a huge uh, performance issues. And uh, this is a topic that is described in several articles we, you, we've wrote. So if you look for a filter table columns on SQL BI, you will find articles that describe this, uh, this problem and, uh, and uh, how you can rewrite the code. The second uh, uh, common error, which in reality is the most dangerous one, is you, you uh, write a measure reference 
in an iterator that is very large. Common example, you write uh, some x, says, uh, comma, and you write a measure that exists in the says table. Where that, whereas that uh, that measure should not be executed row by row in the sales table, it could be executed uh, grouping by, for example, date or customer or something else. So basically, invoking a measure reference in a in a large iterator that has too many rows is a very common mistake that produces a big performance issues and also consumption of memory, which in Power BI Premium is devastating because also limit the scalability of the entire solution. So this is these are the two. Uh, more common issues that I see in Lex. So we have five minutes. Uh, let's see the last questions. Uh, how long does it take to become a DAX master? Oh, this is um, another interesting question. I don't know. It depends on uh, probably how much time uh, you dedicate. So let's consider that, uh, first of all, DAX is much easier than MDX. So if anyone is a master of MDX, uh, Whatever is the amount of time you spent on MDX, DAX requires a, a you know a lower amount of time. Um, Citron is not something that you learn in a, a few days or a few weeks. It uh, requires practice, and it also requires to study some theory. Uh, just don't try to learn DAX by examples because you are going to make a lot of mistakes and losing a lot of time. So spend some time learning the theory, and then it should be not so hard. Uh, at that point, it's just a question of practice because it's a language that has a, some something that is different from any other language, but is required in order to have uh, measures that uh, so business calculation that uh, uh, will be useful in uh, in uh, in any report. And semantic model has a uh, expression that can be reused in any report. So this is uh, so. Let's say it could be a few months. Uh, a few years, it depends on how much time, but I have seen that after six, 12 months, you use it every day, you should become very proficient. If you know, if you dedicate some time to start to study the theory. Okay. Let's see another question. If we have time, yes, uh, why not? Uh, a good question coming, a long question. So, Deb, I have a long background working in the multidimensional and feel very comfortable working with MDX. I'm starting a new data warehouse project for my company and I'm wondering if I'm going to multidimensional solution is the right choice. I know some DAX, but I'm able to do so much uh, with scope statements and utility dimensions. Good question. So, if you look at the, this, this question is complex. So let me provide you two answers. Uh, the answer from your point of view, go multidimensional. In the short term, you are more productive. Now, the answer from the point of view of your company is slightly different. Because from the point of view of your company or your customer, the question is what happens when Deb uh, will, uh, will get another job or will change a role in the company, whatever. At that point, uh, you have to maintain the solution. And uh, if you think about how many people know MDX, how many people know DAX today, there are many more people working with DAX. And potentially over time, there will be many more experts in DAX rather than MDX. If you look at the future, there is another problem. If you look at in five years, we will have many more people learning DAX rather than MDX. Today, if you want to learn MDX, one practical problem, finding uh, courses, books, uh, and training uh, and material, you don't see anything new. Uh, for example, finding ebooks for MDX is not easy because the best books for MDX probably have been written when we didn't have ebooks. It's not uh, a new technology. It is very good. I mean, I know MDX, I love MDX, but there, you may have this problem. It could be harder to find the people skilled on MDX. If you don't have this problem and you know that you're productive, go ahead, use MDX. But if you think about the maintainability of the solution over a longer period of time, I'm not concerned about Microsoft uh, not working on multidimensional. They don't have any reason to leave multidimensional. They will continue to keep it alive. But the real issue is, uh, will, it, will it be possible and easy to find people who, that are able to maintain the solution? That, this is the big question. You should ask this question as a, a manager 
to understand whether the, the choice between uh, MDX or Vax is the right one, assuming that the, the features are the same, of course. Okay, so uh, I think we don't have time for other questions. So let me just uh, uh, say thank you for joining and participating in today's past uh, Facebook Live pop-up session event. Uh, there were some great questions uh, and uh, there is an amazing lineup of experts uh, planned for future events. Uh, so sure, be sure to like and follow the past Facebook page for updates and details on upcoming uh, live uh, pop-up expert sessions like this one of, uh, we made today. Of course, if you're not already a member, you can join PASS by heading over PASS.org pass and creating your profile today. Uh, this is the best place for data professionals to connect, share and learn with a host of educational resources available and no cost to join. There is an upcoming PASS marathon on achieving AI analytics coming up on March 21st as well as uh, 24 hours of past, uh, 20 years of past, uh, past uh, learnings and future visions coming up on April 3 and 4. So make sure to join uh, for two full days of free educational training. Thank you very, very, very much. I enjoyed uh, this session uh, and uh, see you next time.